Once again, we welcome you to today's webinar. This is Sustainability Strategies, Goal Setting and Metrics. This webinar is brought to you by ATE Central. Joining us today is Nancy Marin with Ithaca SNR. She is the Program Director for Sustainability and Scholarly Communications. We also have Edward Almazi joining us. Edward is the Director. of the Internet Scout Research Group at ATE Central. Thank you for joining us today, Nancy and Ed. Ed, would you tell us a little about ATE Central? Sure, thank you. Hi, Ed. If so, you are speaking, we can't I hear you. Could you please hear? <laughs> Hello? I can hear you, Ed. Okay, thanks. So I think as some of you are aware, ATE Central functions as an information support hub for the ATE program. And our core mission, uh, as we view it, is to amplify the impact of ATE. So we do that through things like the information hub and, and web portal that we have, um, and community outreach support, the resource collection that aggregates resources um, created by ATE projects and centers, and of course services and tools and outreach and dissemination efforts that we have um, that are intended to promote the ATE program and, and kind of get the word out there and, and direct people to appropriate ATE projects and centers. So to do all that effectively, we need to be able to assess some of the needs of the ATE community. And we've done that over the last several years via uh, surveys and interviews and just talking to some of, some of you at the ATE PI meeting. And so we, in 2011, did an ATE community needs survey. And one of the key findings out of that survey was that sustainability support was a top need among ATE projects and centers. So this last year, we went into a second phase for ATE Central. And one of the things we incorporated into that second phase was some explicit work on sustainability support for the community. Fortunately, we had a previous relationship um, at Internet Scout, which is the organization that um, is based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison that ATE Central um, comes out of. Fortunately, we had a past relationship with Ithaca SNR. And um, Ithaca has done some significant sustainability research um, in the nonprofit sector. And since we had this relationship with them, we decided to team up um, for a series of workshops and webinars as part of the sustainability support we're doing for AT Central. So working with Nancy Marin and other folks at Ithaca, um, we've put together this series of programs and we hope that it's helpful to you all. And at that, I will turn it over to Nancy to tell you a little bit about Ithaca. Thanks, Ed. And I should just start by saying how pleased I am to be here. Um, I've had a chance to work a little bit with Rachel and Ed over the last couple of years and increasingly to meet many of you. Um, the more I understand uh, what the actual challenges are that you are struggling with every day, the better we'll be able to shape this training into something that's really, really helpful for you. So I, I look forward to those continued conversations in the years ahead. Ithaca itself is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we're located, I'm in New York City, but my colleagues in Ann Arbor and in Princeton as well. And it's an organization with three big divisions. Uh, you may have heard of JSTOR. It's fairly well known. It's a, it's a big, uh, at this point, collection of all sorts of scholarly content from journal articles, books, and primary sources. Um, many of the universities have subscriptions. Portico is a digital preservation service that many libraries participate in. And then Ithaca SNR is the group that I work with. And we have been focused on research and consultancy around a suite of questions, but really all at the intersection of higher education uh, and the, the impact of technology and transformation in the last decade or so on higher education. So the work I've done has specifically been around sustainability questions for big initiatives. So it might be a publishing project. It can be an education-based project. It could be libraries developing big collections of materials. But what they tend to all have in common is a need to think strategically about what it is they're building, what their, their intentions are for it, and then ultimately uh, 
how they're going to sustain it after they've put in all this hard work. The webinar we're doing today is actually part of a series of three. Um, today's will be really on goal setting um, and, uh, and metrics. Um, in March, we will be touching on the questions around the audience, both identifying and understanding their needs, but also really in the outreach needed to go and get them to engage with you as, as you would like them to. And then in April, we'll talk about partnerships. So I'll, I'll remind you at the end of the call as well, but we certainly are always eager to hear examples from you of, of ways that this is working for you. And the more we can integrate that into, the, into our work, the better. Today's webinar has a couple of fairly clear goals. <laughs> First, we're going to review the aims of sustainability. And um, those of you who have participated with us before in these events know that our definition may be a bit broader than others you've heard before. We're going to encourage you in this hour to really define the impact that you want your project or center to have. And while I know this sounds very obvious on one level, we found that having the explicit conversation can be valuable. We're going to help you define specific measurable goals as a path for actually attaining that impact. And finally, we'll offer some guidance in setting and measuring appropriate targets. But let's start off with a quick poll. So this will give us a chance to see if that polling function is working. Uh, question one, have you attended an ATE Central or Ithaca sustainability webinar or workshop in the last year? Choice A would be for yes, and choice B would be for no. So I'm no expert here, but I believe we've been instructed to click on the appropriate Yes, please use your uh, icon window. there. It looks like a check mark. It's the fourth icon from the left. All right. Well, oh. For some reason, uh, uh, it, we're um, trying to make our responses final. visible, but they are <laughs> not uh, showing. However, it does look <laughs> as if well more than half, or about half, uh, have attended uh, a webinar in the past. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Well, I'll be counting on especially the folks who've attended before. So to let me know if this has helped to deepen their understanding. You may find some things familiar. And hopefully there will be some new as well. Oh, there's our poll. Hopefully everyone can see that. So it looks like about 13 people said yes, and, and seven have not attended, and a couple are still playing with the controls to figure them out. So let's move ahead. But that's nice to see. I'm glad that that's having that. So here's the second poll question. Because there could be a lot of reasons that people would find a topic like this interesting. Uh, let us know why you are attending today. I am interested in goal setting now because A, you may be starting a new grant or initiative within your project, or B, you are looking to fine tune the goals that you have already set. All right, great. Terrific. So, and that's, that's terrific to see too. So we see that five people have responded that they're actually undertaking something new and they're trying to uh, establish the goals for something, a, a new project or initiative. And about 12 are looking to fine tune. And that's already great to see because um, we clearly feel like this is a process that is, is valuable uh, to revisit even after a project has been begun. You know, I didn't leave a C, and we don't have other options. Um, I, I, I would love, obviously, to know <laughs> about the people who chose neither. But um, maybe we'll wait until a little bit farther, farther into the presentation to open up the floor for that. But um, I'm always curious to hear uh, what people find the most useful. <clears throat> so what does goal setting have to do with sustainability? You may be wondering. Um, here are some 
some counter questions we've heard. You know, really, isn't this just basic project planning? And didn't I already establish the goals when I took all that time writing the grant proposal? Um, for those of us already working on projects, I have metrics. I know what my evaluation plan looks like. <laughs> Why do I need to think about this more? So what we would say is, yes, clearly, you, the promises you made in the grant are, are the ones you need to keep. Um, this particular session, we're hoping, is going to help you uh, and maybe even urge you to establish even more ambitious goals, but achievable goals, for your next grant or to focus on the one you have. Um, you may be actually in a project or in a, in a grant cycle that you see is coming to an end. And the other very specific reason people would undertake this process is because actually they're trying to ask themselves, what is my post-grant strategy? You know, there might be a no obvious funding plan. The first question is going to be, what would a best case scenario look like for me in this next phase I'm moving into? And then finally, um, I'm hoping that the framework we are going to offer may provide a new way just to think about how the goal setting exercise is directly tied in to what that big impact is that you want to reach. We're seeing this as a way both to encourage you to reach very high and also to offer some very pragmatic skills and, and tools for tying operational goals to the grander impact that you're seeking. So sustainability, the way we are looking at it, at least for this hour, is, is a cycle. It's not an answer and it's not a, a list of instructions that's immutable, but it's really the creation and revisiting of a cycle of reliable support. It does presuppose a few important things. It does suggest that the thing you've created, you have some intention of continuing it, or that the materials will continue, or that the work will continue, and possibly even grow beyond the current stage. And that's important to think about, because if the expectations are otherwise, or it's finished so it's done, then probably you don't need to worry so much about it. It also implies that the thing that you've created is really something special, and that you've developed something of real value. And that value is valuable to a specific group or groups of people. Um, it's something valuable enough for people to continue to want and to support in a range of ways. So sustainability is this ability that you're going to come, come up with and a, a strategy for generating or getting any access to the suite of resources you're going to need. And these can be financial or non-financial. That's going to help you to protect and increase the value, whether it's a service, a project, initiative, center, um, over time. And the plan is really going to be this evidence-based strategy to get you there. This is the graphic that I, I I'd love to show you that I feel like it's important to explain, although I still struggle with the graphics myself. But we just like to um, suggest that you might recognize these elements that almost looks in a way like uh, something you talk about for a business plan. That your project or center may not be exactly a business, or for some it may be, but in a lot of important ways, for it to be successful, some of these key principles that are common in the business world are, are very uh, transferable and very important. So here's a way of seeing how those elements work together. The inputs that you get from understanding your audience, from understanding the environment that you travel in, are the things that are going to help you really define what, your, what the goal is and what the value is that you deliver for your project or center. Once you have that, that kind of the goal and the value proposition defined, that's going to help to provide a set of very specific, really that's the blueprint, marching orders for how to get there. The goals are going to define the activities that will support those goals, the costs and resources that will be required to execute them, and finally the funding sources that will support them. So this also provides a little mini blueprint of the kinds of topics that we'd be happy to work with you uh, and your colleagues with over the next few years. But I'll take a little pause right now to see if there are any Nancy, questions. Nancy, we do have one question. Um, it asks, do ATE projects or centers ever work with yes. their college foundations to help with sustainability? Oh, and I wonder if this is actually a question that we can kind of bounce back out to participants. Are there examples of folks on the line who have had that experience? 
I suppose the easiest way maybe is to type into that chat box. Would that be right, Janet? Well, I mean, I'm not sure if I have. Uh, if you're talking about, um, let's see, if the question is really about um, seeking a college foundation, like seeking financial support or seeking like strategic planning support, um, I guess I could imagine that. But I, I wonder if you could ask the yeah financial support. So I wonder, are there are there examples of folks on the line who have actually? Uh, what we have a few foundation? folks typing that may be able to address that. Um, and so if you're working with your ATE projects okay. or centers, um, do you know if any of them have their own college foundations that they have worked with in the past, or is that not something that your um, uh, research uh, shows? Right. Well, I mean, I don't actually Let's see. We have, oh, we have a few. Sure, answers. no problem. Um, um, would you like to read we some do have some folks that uh, say that we've obtained additional funding yes. from our college foundation for research project support, equipment, and professional development opportunities. So they've um, been able to use that uh, funding for actual to, to be able to produce deliver deliverables. And then I see another response. That came in uh, from Heather that says that she hasn't worked directly with the foundation for support, but she has worked with strategic planning processes to secure hard funding during the funded span of the project. Right, and I, I suppose you mean um, like that your own initiative that you know has worked has used the strategic planning process as a way of identifying new funding sources. And, and that's great. I mean, often what, what those processes can do is to really help you zero in on uh, the area of strength that you then use as a as the thing that you can carry out to potential funders. Um, you know, for me, without knowing the details, this is what's so tricky with um, with doing this so quickly um, uh, online is that it's hard for me to kind of get inside some of these projects. Um, but those processes are really valuable. Um, I don't know if this was what the original uh, question was touching on a little bit, but there might be resources on campus. It could be a business school, um, you know, or or even a you know a professor who, who deals with not-for-profit organizations who actually can also support exactly. this kind of an exercise, or even actually business exactly. students Thanks, Nancy. Um, at a neighboring institution. So there's all kinds of resources. All right. <laughs> okay, you're very welcome. So let's move on. Um, all paths to sustainability are going to start with impact. So that could be impact for your audience. And we're using audience as a very broad term. It could be faculty, students, or really anyone else you see as your end users and primary beneficiaries. Or it can be for your stakeholders. And that's typically your host institution or some funders. But this idea of goal setting to reach that impact is really the foundation for future success period. Um, it can be too easy to, once a project is started, to have a focus turn a little bit inward and be focused on accomplishing tasks, even if those tasks are quite impressive. Um, or even to think about sustainability as if it's a totally separate topic that, that will happen at some later point when we realize that we're reaching the end of a goal, or end of a grant. But instead, We'd like you to think about this as being integrally connected to the goal setting and impact that your initiative has. So in terms of the session we're doing today, the basic underlying logic is the more fabulous you can make the initiative you're doing and the more ways that you can show impact among these different audiences, uh, the more potential paths to sustainability you will have at your disposal. So I'll stop and tell a quick story about um, a project that if you have attended some of my sessions, you may have heard me talk about before. So I won't spend too much time on this. But it's an interesting example um, of how impact has led to sustainability. This is eBird, an NSF-funded citizen science project at the Lab of Ornithology at Cornell University. Over several years, this initiative went from kind of a nice, clever citizen science project uh, intended to gather Amateur birders' observations of birds 
um, just having some trouble getting regular people to participate. Um, the logic was if you had a lot of burning observations, professional ornithologists would have a huge trove of data to mine. Uh, however, no one told the birders that they really were interested in doing that, uh, for the benefit of science, that is. So the early efforts of this initiative were focused a little too inwardly. They, they all thought collectively it was a great idea, but it wasn't until they stopped and realized that they weren't reaching enough birders. That there was a much, much bigger, there's a world of millions of birders out there that just weren't engaging, but they realized they wanted to set their sights a bit higher. They wanted to actually try bring in as many birders as they could from what's a tremendous audience. And to do that, they actually started devoting a huge set of activities and a lot more resource to developing a set of tools that birders would like to use. In this case, it was something as humble as a checklist. You can go out, now you can download an app, but at the time you could just log onto your account uh, and record how many birds of what species you saw. And this made the initiative take off. So now they're getting millions of observations every month and it's become quite successful in many ways. So how does impact lead to sustainability? Because it is not a foregone conclusion that it will. Um, but in this case, they've been very clever. And um, I just jotted down a few ways that this has worked for them. And I will look forward from you and appearing in many ways that your impact has also directly linked you to great sustainability strategies. I've just gotten a note that it's a little hard to hear me. I'm wondering if we can do a quick check. Is my sound coming through OK? OK, great. OK, terrific. I'll, I'll try to keep my voice exactly at the same, my, right at the same distance from the microphone. So in this case for eBird, if you look at this, I sketched out the different sources of value for this particular initiative. Content, for example, all the observations, the value that it has and the impact it has is that it has reached to millions of birders, or thousands of birders, and millions of birding observations now live in there, which has tremendous value for academic ornithologists and others who chew through this data for reasons. As a result, this has led to sustainability, for example, great support from the research community and these ongoing submissions into the uh, database. The tools and features that people use in the way they interface with the system is a tremendous treat for amateur birders. And the way this works, um, so I guess first of all, that also drives people to use it. But the tools themselves had a tremendous impact that led the organization to be able to franchise and license some of the tools themselves. The audience, maybe the key thing about this impact is how many people are using the site, whether they're academics or they're um, amateurs, and at the end of the day, by creating impact in those communities, a third party, uh, a commercial organization, decided that they wanted to be part of the act too, and now they are a corporate sponsor. And then finally for missions, the lab and the university clearly are quite proud of the achievements and the research that's come out of this data, and that has led to unlocking institutional support, support of the development office, and a huge amount of volunteer labor. So not to belabor this too much, but I'd like you to continue to see the links between impact goal setting and sustainability, because we feel they're quite important. So just to remind you, we see these things as, as interrelated. And the next part of this presentation is going to take you through a step-by-step -step process of first identifying the impact, stating a goal that's a quantifiable, achievable goal, and then breaking that down into parts. This is really a logic model. You almost certainly have worked with these before. But there's something somewhat refreshing about working through it. If you haven't done it for a little while, it can sometimes tease out some areas um, that you want to look at a bit more. So first, let's get started. When you think about your initiative, what is it? what kind of impact is it that you want your, your project or center to have? You know, if we were working around a table, I'd, I'd take a longer pause right now to give you just a moment to think about it, maybe jot something down. So you may want to do that. Just think about how you would define the impact. What is it that you want to see as the outcome of all the work you're doing now? So 
So with that in mind, I'm going to take us through a series of steps that are going to help us to get to this plan. And again, this will not be uh, anything shockingly new if you've, if you've come to an introduction to sustainability, but I think the steps will be helpful. Maybe we can work through them together. The first is to describe that future impact you have in mind. Then to set some specific goals about each element, and we'll, we'll cover that together, and to identify activities and staff. This session is not going to get to numbers four and five, which has to do with real budgeting questions and then funding model questions. But if those are areas that you care deeply about, again, please let me know. We could easily do separate sessions just on budgeting and just on funding model. So the question is really think about the change you want to make. Is it that you really want to create curriculum that is used across the country? It might be that you want to have more women or specific population uh, to graduate in equal numbers from within the STEM disciplines. It can be anything like that. You want to think specifically about who you most want to help and how you want to help them. So for example, is it is the target teachers, is it a certain kind of student, students from certain backgrounds. But getting that as specific as you can is quite helpful. And finally, we really encourage you to kind of think big. In a best case scenario, how great could your impact be? Are you going to choose to support, for example, just the women in a certain discipline on your campus or women in that discipline on campuses across the country? Um, is it enough if you're doing curriculum development to have a, a handful of campuses uh, use the materials? Or is your goal actually to have is your goal actually to have your content used in programs around the whole country? So thinking about scale is going to be important too. Um, I, I see some questions coming in. I don't mind taking a pause here. Uh, are there questions? If I could just interject, Nancy. Sure. Um, I'd like to just note that often when you look at the kind of impact you want to make, what you're trying to achieve with your project or center, you've presumably laid that out in your grant proposal. But often as you go along, you find that what you laid out kind of collides with reality and learn to hone what you were thinking you were going to achieve in the long term. So it isn't just what you put in the proposal. It's often something beyond that. Um, maybe a little bit different from what you originally laid out. Um, so I think it's it's good to think about what you learned in the time since the project has uh, has started. Right, and that's I mean that's a that's a great point. I mean these things also change. I mean um, we we have done a, a unit as well that just talks about the environment um, because the things that made perfect sense the month you were finishing the application for the grant. You know the environment may very well have moved on, and it, it may suggest great opportunities or or the need to shift. So um, for all those reasons, uh, it's very important to continue. So let's let's give some examples here. Some people can get bogged down. We do exercises with folks. It's often a little bit tricky to actually put their impact goals into um, into words. So I thought I'd take a stab at some examples. These are examples. I have paraphrased them and protected the identities of all those involved, but this is from a recent workshop we ran. Um, and these are all kind of valid things to aspire to. So I'll give you an example. My goal is I want to spend down my grant. I want to execute all elements of my grant as well as I can, or even with excellence. I want to double the number of women in the engineering track at my institution. I want to provide state-of-the-art training for instructors of my topic. I want to provide all students in my institution with internships with local industry partners. So have a, take a moment and have a, have a look at these. Um, I'd like to humbly suggest that there might be some here that are, are more equal than others. You know, which ones don't really speak to impact as well as others might? Right, so if you guessed that the first couple are 
not quite as lofty in terms of setting goals, you would be correct. Spending down a grant and executing with excellence are, are critical. And those are kind of bottom line things we must do. But let's take a look at the ones below it. What do they have in common? Um, at the end of the day, they address a specific audience that's going to have be impacted. I can use that as a verb um, by the work you're doing, and it sometimes names a very specific outcome that's going to be measurable. And this doesn't even get to real numbers and measurement, but at least we're talking about um, specific actions on a very important target audience. So, so I hope I hope that that's clear and that's a, that's a useful distinction. It's even extremely experienced um, project leaders can sometimes get a little bit bogged down in things that sound a little bit too much like the first two on this list. Um, so I have a formal slide here for questions, but I'm keeping an eye on the box, and I think I think we'll just keep going. But feel free to write in, and we have um, someone capturing that uh, at questions as they come. So. Here's our grid. This framework for post-grant sustainability planning really doesn't have to be post-grant. It can just be for sustainability planning. But I thought I'd show and walk with you how this works. So where you see that highlighted part, that's where you could drop in this impact goal that you may have developed. And in this case, I've imagined one that says develop state-of-the-art curriculum on my topic that is adopted in institutions throughout the country. So far, so good. Next, now to the hard part, the operational goals. We're going to ask you to start to set specific and quantifiable goals, but the question is where do you start and what kinds of questions do you ask to get there? So this is our second step, setting specific goals for each element. What do you need to sustain? And here we have some prompts. And so these are my prompts for you, but you may have other areas. But in general, if you take a look at the, what you've been building, is there some kind of technology that's involved, whether you have a website or a digital content that you've created that you have to sustain? Is there staffing? How about the fact that you'll need project management going forward? That might be something critical. Even your time might be critical. Uh, it certainly is a critical part of it. Um, there might be partnerships. We've heard at these workshops how labor intensive it is to create and maintain partnerships. That is something that needs to be planned for and budgeted for. Um, similarly, if you're developing curriculum or other content, that might be something that you'll need to think about how, how much to grow and how much do you need to make from year to year. And again, not just because of what it will cost, but also because of what do you need to attain in order for you to have the impact you want. Same questions for faculty uptake and student impact. Um, what is it that needs to happen for this project not just to be uh, surviving, but really, really thriving? So those are some ideas of columns we've, we've provided. You'll see where the second arrow is. Um, it shows technical requirements, content, access and discovery. These are just some suggestions of areas you may want to bring to a personal brainstorm on where you want to think about, given that impact goal, now that I've put my, you know, drawn my line in the sand, I've staked my claim, this is what I want to do, what will need to happen in each of those areas in order to have that impact? So I just you know, hazarded an, an example here. So for example, what, what might that look like for this great state of the art curriculum I have? It might mean that on the technology side, I've got to make sure that I'm upgrading this website because it's going to be the portal in the way people access this content. Let's talk about the content. I've said this is going to be state of the art curriculum on this topic. Well, uh, I don't know what the right number is yet. Let me say I'm going to develop five new course modules per year. Uh, let me say that I'm going to make sure that they're peer reviewed so I'll have a faculty review board that meets twice a year. So those are going to be activities that are going to have to happen for me to reach that impact, even to have a chance to reach that impact, and so on and so forth. But on audience and impact, let's look at the fourth column over. I'm going to say that in order for me to have that level of impact, I'm going to reach out to 20 program directors. And my goal for myself is to get the curriculum adopted in 10 new sites in the next calendar year. So this is the first, the first level of planning. It's a, it's a set of um, setting some operational goals and starting to attach numbers to them. Once you've done that, the next thing is to think about what those activities are attached to that. 
So right, so I said I'm going to update that website. What does that mean? It's going to be tech, tech upgrades. It might be adding new content to the site. Um, I might have to manage subscriber lists. Who knows what it is? But I'm going to think about all the activities that, that are going to have to be covered. The same for content, for example. In this case, this means that um, to find people to create this content. It may be me. It may be people I hire. It may be people who contribute it. But it's certainly going to be a, an amount of work and an amount of labor that's going to have to come to bear. I want to deal with search uh, engine optimization. I may just decide I'm hiring a consultant to come in and fix that for me if I don't have staff to do it. And then for the audience and impact, I'm going to take some guesses about what it's going to take to get those 10 new sites. I'm going to say I'm going to attend conferences and I'm going to have a targeted outreach to 20 campuses just to get the 10 I say I want. So at this stage, we're just guessing, and that's fine. Um, as we like to say, these plans change, but there's a greater likelihood of achieving the goals even if we just take a stab at them for the first for the first shot, and we can refine later. We do have so a couple of questions, questions at this Nancy. Point. Um, please continue to type in um, as we move along here. But first, we have. Uh, has anyone used volunteer labor to sustain the management aspect of a center or a project? Anyone that you've worked with, Ed or Nancy? Oh, um, yeah, we to sustain, to sustain the, the management, <laughs> management aspect or of a center or a project. Element? Well, I mean, let's put it this way. Actually, way too often what we see, especially among um, PIs who have academic appointments is that they've gotten an initial grant to, to develop something and then once the grant ends, they literally volunteer themselves to keep doing this, whether it's nights and weekends and everything else. Um, that's actually the reality. I'm not going to suggest that that is ideal. Um, more ideal um, may not be full-time management. I mean, there's all kinds of examples of volunteer labor, even Scholarly journals are, are run almost entirely through volunteer labor of the academics who edit them. Um, but there are lots of examples too. Um, eBird has lots of layers of reviewers, for example. So do other initiatives we've studied, like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, where there's a huge amount of work being done, and a lot of it gets done by a volunteer layers of volunteer staff and reviewers all along the way. Um, but the word that jumped out when you asked me this question, I think, was management. And um, more often than not, um, I think it's very difficult to have the person actually running and setting ambitious goals and executing and delivering on those goals be a volunteer. It's not that it can't happen. It's just that if that person also <laughs> has a job elsewhere, um, it's necessarily going to curtail right, so the they amount of time they may not be there. Have. Yeah, I, think that, I think that one thing that we've seen occasionally that kind of falls along these lines is not direct assistance necessarily with management, um, but drawing upon the expertise of an advisory committee or somebody else that you make connections with, um, sometimes in the private sector, sometimes on your campus, that can help provide guidance and um, maybe tackle specific management related challenges that arise. So it's, it's something that maybe doesn't kick in directly with res respect to help with management, but um, you can offload a little bit of the, the thinking and strategizing necessary by drawing on those people that you've established relationships with. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a great point. I mean, bringing us back into like the, the, the overarching point is if, if the initiative you you've invested in um, really is proving its value to, to the community, to the, the people that it's serving, and also the people that are engaging it, and it, whether they're getting some professional value, just personal feeling of happiness from doing it, or, or otherwise, um, they will keep doing it. Um, so what that means is that the act of engaging those volunteers itself almost has to be its own, its own set of goals meaning that we can't really ever take for granted that, that volunteer labor. And, and that, also, that almost becomes Excellent. another Thank you. Um, we did have one more question, that's OK. Oh, all right. It says, how can I follow students yeah. one sure. to three years after a project ends? 
what tools might be available that they can uh, incorporate into their program. Do you need follow students to track uh, yes, progress exactly. after they've left the institution or for the program? Um, I don't know that I have any any great specific recommendations on that. Um, I know that there's some like there's some uh, educational uh, educational software that school districts use to track this on a very big scale, like Naviance and things like that. Um, I don't know if that's the scale that that you're thinking about. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if others on the line have suggestions about Excellent. software Thank that's you. useful for tracking. Well, if others have suggestions and want to write them, then we'll definitely share them back out with the whole group. Um, but it's a great idea, by the way. And in fact, the, the low tech, the low tech thing is what we have been doing lately because we we don't have such a huge scale that we're unable to. We literally just keep we keep lists and we we track the people. We keep the database of the people that have, we have worked with, and we use a, you know whatever our the softwares that we've licensed here to do polls and surveys. And occasionally phone calls just to, to to follow up. I guess it really depends on the number of people you have passing through the program as to what software. Yeah, perfect. Will be I think that's the exactly most what they were asking. So um, <laughs> okay, okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So now that you've got some goals, are they the right goals, right? So first of all, you know, what do you think they should be? That's probably what you wrote down first, and that's great. The next question is about what do your beneficiaries want and need and what do your funders expect those goals to be are pretty important too. And if for some reason you're not entirely sure about what scale of goal and how ambitious this needs to grow, the, you know, there's, that's, that's a nice piece of research to do is to go back and make sure you're checking in with both your target audience and those funders. But I'm going to give you just an example of the kind of thinking I, I, I wish I saw even more um, and I, we start, we're starting to see with some project leaders. So let's look at Project A. You might you might have ten institutions adopting curriculum that you've developed, which is fine, and, and that might be a big number, might be a small number. We we don't know unless we know more about it, really. But I just started with ten. At the end of the year, they've gotten twenty institutions to use the curriculum, and that sounds like a great message because the message that you will hear, and I'm sure the, the evaluator will share with. The funder is we increase uptake by 100 percent, and of course that's great. Who would say no to that? But a slightly different way to look at that is what we have for Project B, where you start with those 10 institutions adopting the curriculum, which is great. But the project leader looks around, does a little research, and figures out that there are actually a thousand instructors in the country who are working in this space, and that could potentially be adopting this material. So instead of saying let's just let's double it and talk about you know impressive growth by percentages, let's actually figure out what the largest potential audience could be for this. So in this case, maybe they say you know what let's try for a hundred in 2015. And if the impact ends up starting there, the goal ends up starting there, you'll see it's a whole different set of activities that you might be prompted to develop around that. How can we get to 100? How can we get to 200 in the next year? Is there any reason why all 1,000 shouldn't be using this? So it's a, it's a way to kind of shift the question. We're not just going to look for incremental growth and a little more each year, but let's see what the, the biggest splash we can make would be and then go for it. So here's another way to look at this. Here's the original example I showed um, with the state of the art curriculum on some topic. Here are the two areas where I suggested you'd want to attach numbers. We're developing curriculum, so how many course modules should we have and how many institutions should they be in? So what are some key questions? You know, there's no answer to this. The answer will be very specific to, to the courses and the institutions and everything else of your specific circumstance. But you might want to ask, for example, well, how many modules would be needed in this subject area? You might want to know more about how much demand is there for these topics. Is it growing? Are there more students coming into this space every year? Or is it one that's actually hit its peak? And then within that, which topic should be prioritized? In terms of the number of institutions, you may want to ask how many institutions in the country even have this program? How many students is each of these institutions serving? How many people are coming through this um, every year? 
is the course taught by in other departments? Is there a possibility that it's not just one department, but it might be two or three where this would be useful? And then how many instructors are we talking about? So how many individuals do I need to make it my job to reach out to <laughs> to get this work adopted? So you'll see this is really just a strategy for taking uh, a general, I think this is the right number, to something awfully specific, and not just a specific number that comes out of the air, but a specific number that is targeted at the greatest possible impact. So moving from goal to metrics. And now that I've set my goal, how do I know if I'm getting there? First question. Poll question number three. Do you currently have a set of metrics that you monitor on a regular basis? Choice A would be yes, and choice B would be no. So if you just take a minute and respond, we're in the home stretch. <laughs> uh, but we'd love to hear about this because we have a feeling a lot of people are doing it. Probably this would be an even better topic to do around a table to hear the full flavor of the different metrics people are using. Right, so of those who are responding, I see if folks aren't jumping in as much as they were at the beginning, and that's fine. But many people are capturing some kind of metrics, and, and that's great. And actually, we do hear that a lot of people are doing it. And, and again, um, that's a great thing, and obviously tied very much into the very um, kind of rigorous evaluation I know you all undertake. The problem, I'd just like to mention a couple of you know uh, headlines on this topic. And the first is that the problem with metrics is that the the problem with data is that there's often too much, you know, and the, the trick is choosing just those data points that are going to be able to be meaningful to make your case. Um, the second point really is that it's making your case is one element and judging your progress is really the other critical element. So when you think about the goals you set, let's assume just this is an example uh, just of how this could work. The first stage is to say, my goal is to increase usage. There could be tons of ways to measure that. So on the right column, you'll see, I just jotted down the first few that came to mind. Usage, who knows what that could be. The number of visitors to a website, the type of people who are coming, the number of downloads of this document or that document or this module, the length of their visit, or what they do when they're there. So. As you know, there's a, a million different ways um, that this can all be measured, and it really has to do very specifically with, again, what your first stated big goal is. Um, so everything is going to derive from that. You know, some examples I've given in these bulleted points over here. In this case, it could be I want to double the number of items that are downloaded each year. Right now, it's at 100,000, and I'd like it to be at two. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Or it could be something like, I'm going to increase the usage among faculty from five courses per year to 100 courses per year. So there's all sorts of ways you can do it. Um, the, the, the real takeaway here, again, is that it needs always to derive from and support the ultimate goal that you've set and not shy away, or shy away from making that a fairly ambitious goal. Oh, I'm sorry, this is really pretty jumpy here. So for example, um, on the question, five new course modules, what, hap what needs to happen for me to consider the content I've developed to be a success? I'm saying it's five new course modules, the presence of a review board, and getting the curriculum adopted in 10 programs. That starts to be the basis for the metrics I'm going to want to measure. So again, this is not very mysterious. Um, we just want to draw these lines as, as tightly as we can. Um, I've now actually named some of the things I want to have happen. There are a couple important things that come from that. So I've named the goal. I may want to know a few different things. I may want to know by when I think I will have accomplished it. So in this case, we said it's going to happen in a year. But I'd even encourage you to break that down to finer sections. So when I'm doing my own planning, I know what's happening by the end of the year. But I also know where I need to be in the process by a few months into the year for me to have any chance to reach that goal by the end. So you want to stage those goals, not just what's going to have happened by December 31st or the end of your fiscal year, but give yourself a, a chance to, to 
look inside and under the hood along the way to make sure that you're making progress. For each goal, you want to determine how will you measure progress. Is it going to be a certain number of steps accomplished, a certain number of signed contracts, a certain number of um, committed institutions? Whatever it is, those are terms that, again, are so specific to your work, I can't tell you exactly what they will be, but you'll have to define them in a way that's quite specific. And then how often will I measure progress? Um, you know, sometimes once a year is going to be fairly meaningless. Um, you're going to want some things to look at all the time. If you're looking at, um, you know, for a course enrollment, twice a year is probably pretty good, or three if you have a summer term. For other things, it's going to be maybe monthly. And so again, it's fine to have different timetables, but you should establish at the outset what they will be. But then one of the most important things to think about here is that these metrics, it is really why we gather them and why we, why we look at this as a dashboard. On one hand, we want to report back. We're, we're, we're doing responsibly. We're doing a good job. We want to let the funders know. We want to have some good talking points when we go speak to another funder. But almost just as important is we want to know things aren't going well. So there's a chance to, to change course or to think of new strategies. So in closing, when you're thinking about metrics themselves, it's a, the raw material for a terrific story to tell others, but it also is most important as your way of knowing how well you are tracking um, your way back up that cascade, back through the operational goals you said you would do, which are the building blocks for the sustainability goals in each of the functional areas you said you were going to do, which all together, if you've built this well, will ultimately result in the impact that, that you really most want to have. So I'll pause again. We're, we're right at the end of the presentation. I wonder if anyone yeah, has see, any while questions. While folks at this are point. Uh, typing in their final questions, I'm going to take just a moment so, uh, and launch a survey. And if everyone could please just take a moment to fill this out. Your feedback is very important to us. Yeah, um, Janet, I also see. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, we're having a bit of a difficulty. We'll take care of that in just a moment. But while we're waiting for that, um, I wanted to ask if anyone else had additional questions. Uh, I don't see any that have been typed in, but I wanted to ask if you could very quickly um, give um, any final notes that you wanted to to add, to add about um, being able to either use volunteers or um, how to track the uh, students, in, in other words, how, what you've used in the past to track students. Yeah, I mean, that, that um, has not been, that, I think, I, mean, I don't know that I have anything further to add. I, like I said, I think there's some really big enterprise level systems, and Naviance is the one that our school district has used. But um, I'm sure there's a ton of things that are much lighter weight that would be effectively, you know, polling systems where you just capture the panel of people and remember to go back to them. Um, it looks like the survey has loaded. Um, if folks have also see what I'm seeing, then um, 
please feel free to fill this in. Yep, we'll give everyone just about a minute and a half to go ahead. We'll give everyone about a minute or so just to go ahead and fill that information in, and I'll give I'm you a countdown um, in about 45 seconds. I'm tracking the students. Um, I'd just like to note that one arm of a lot of uh, on a lot of campuses that has a lot of experience for obvious reasons at connecting with and, and tracking students after they've left the institution is the uh, alumni outreach folks. So they may have some insight into data that may be available on your institution on your campus that you can draw from. Um, That's that right. A else? lot of campuses do have their own um, alumni groups that work not just with events but also in doing exactly that, which is tracking where they've gone after graduation. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and count down uh, 10 more seconds to fill in the information. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, and one. We'd like to thank our guests. So I just before I see people are leaving. Before people leave, I just wanted to uh, remind you of the two webinars that are coming up, and to encourage you, especially to reach out to Ed, to reach out to me, to reach out to Rachel, particularly if you have examples that you would like to share that have to do with audience recruitment and in, uh, partnerships with industry in particular. We'd love to hear from you. and to Absolutely. You Thank you, Ed and Nancy. Um, this concludes our webinar. It is our pleasure to host you today. Thank you for your attendance. Goodbye, everyone. And it